All right. Today I have a special guest on. Today I have Alex Deacon from the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania market. He's an investor. He's a broker. He's a mentor. He has over 30 years of experience. He's a top five agent nationwide. He's owner of Deacon Hoover Real Estate, and he's also owner of Mace Property Management. So welcome to my channel, Alex. Yeah. So Alex, uh, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit to my audience? Sure, we'll do, Mark. And uh, thanks for the shirt. See, I'm wearing his shirt. Uh, Aloha. Thank you for sending that to me. Yeah. Did you I get you it. got the card right with the message about why it's upside down? You know what? I I did get the card, but I didn't read the card. Oh, okay. So now there's, it's sitting at yes, home. I'm going to so have to read it. Okay. There's a reason why. I did not know that. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Um, yeah. My name is Alex Deacon. I'm an expert in the real estate market in the city of Pittsburgh which is Pennsylvania. And I didn't realize there's another Pittsburgh. Did you know that? I did not. There's I... one in Atlanta. I was on bigger pockets one time and I'm like, yeah, I know all about the market. Dad. And he's like, well, this I'm talking about the Pittsburgh in Atlanta. I'm like, Oh, it's, it's uh, Georgia, somewhere in Georgia. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Pittsburgh PA. Um, I've been investing in real estate since it's uh, it's been thir over 30 years now. I own a pretty substantial portfolio, decent amount of properties um, and we manage, uh, properties for other clients. We manage about 700 units. And we also, I'm also an agent. We have a brokerage. So we help investors find properties, help investors sell properties. So I do everything that you can think of when it comes to residential real estate and small multifamily. Yeah. I don't get into these large hundred unit buildings and such. It's just not my, it's not my lane. I try to stay in my lane. I'm very good at single families, two, two plexes, three units, four units, nine units, things like that. So that's what I do. I'm an, I'm an investor. I help other investors and I am an expert in Pittsburgh real estate market period. I don't, I don't invest anywhere else. This is, this is where I live and this is where I invest. I love it. I think that's why I have this great connection with you is your mindset about the single family homes and, you know, you're not bigger is not always better. And I think that's why this relationship is, is going to go somewhere. But I, I definitely love that, that mindset, but has yeah, how really did we meet. I can't, was it th through bigger pockets? No, I was it through one was of my just, agents. No, I just reached out. I was searching for, so I, I was already investing in the Pittsburgh in the Pennsylvania market, uh, I was already investing and I was just reaching out to make more connections. And I came across you more from the man, the property management side. So you're, so I don't know if I, I didn't catch if you touched on that, but um, your Mace property management company. Mm -hmm. um, so see. that's why I reached out first. And then, you know, we started talking more about investing and whatnot. And I just, I, I really loved that mindset of bigger is not always better. And, you know, you like the single family home space and, and that's where we connected. And um, I also kind of want to touch on, I mean, has, has real estate though, been this, this dream of yours ever since you were little and, and that's why you're, you're so successful well, at it you know, now? That's a great question. Um, I, I think it has been, I, it went, it went dormant for a while. Cause I remember when I was a kid, probably between the age of I don't know, 11 and 14. I just remember I would get on my bike and I would take my M Monopoly game over to my friend's house and we would play Monopoly because I loved Monopoly. I loved control. I loved owning all the hotels, just like on Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You, you know, you buy four houses and trade them. For I loved that game. I really did. And but then I kind of forgot about it. You become a teenager. You, you know, you get a car, you get, you know, girls and you know, yeah, partying. And anyway, <laughs> I ended up becoming a mechanic. So that's what I did hmm. out of high school. I went to be a mechanic. So I was a mechanic for six or seven years. And then a friend of mine was buying real estate uh, who was a mechanic. And I'm like, well, gee whiz, that's that's pretty cool. I don't know why I waited till I was, you know, 27 or 26 to to start looking into real estate. And that's when I bought my first. Um, I'm sorry. No, I wasn't 26 or 27. I was like, um, I was about 26. I bought my first three unit. My wife was not happy. We still rented a house from my sister and I bought a three unit up the street. So she was not happy. We bought a single family home after that. And then, you know, I bought a six unit and a duplex and it just, it just, it went from there. And, um, I think it's always been a passion of mine. I just, 
it was just funny when I was a kid, I liked Monopoly and then it went dormant for a while and then the stars aligned and I jumped back in it at some point 30 years ago. So what it what I'm hearing is that it, it hasn't always been a success story for you in real estate. Is that kind of accurate? 100%. 100%. I, I jumped in too quick. You know, when I was buying real estate, this is, you know, this is 1993. Three, I think when I bought my first one, 92 and a half, somewhere in there, it was a lot easier to buy. They were giving money away. Anybody could borrow money. It was easy. Um, there were, a, there was a lot less competition now with the internet, with the explosion of information, it's everybody's getting into it. So it, it here's what I say. It's all, it's such an easy thing to conceptualize, right? You buy a property, you fix toilets, you collect rent. The tenants pay for your lifestyle, right? Very easy to conceptualize. And it's very easy to buy something. I mean, to, to be honest, like $150,000 uh, duplex it, for $30,000, you can get into it. And if you're creative, you can even do it for less than that, right? So it's easy to conceptualize. Therefore, the demand is very high. The competition is fierce. There's a lot of competition. And... You can easily get yourself into trouble if you don't do your don't do your homework and don't run your numbers. And some people they run their numbers, but they really don't run the correct numbers. You know, they don't they don't they don't set aside enough for repairs and they don't set aside enough for those rainy days. And that got me in trouble too, where I had owned quite a few units and right around two thousand year two thousand. Um, I mean, I was losing about five thousand dollars a month and. At that time, five thousand dollars a month was a lot of money to me. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> I had to sell a lot of good properties. That here's the challenge: I had some really good properties, and I had some really crappy ones that were over leveraged. I couldn't even sell the crappy ones. I had to sell the good ones so I could continue making my mortgage payment to keep the crappy ones. You know, because I couldn't sell the crappy ones. I owed one hundred and ten, and they were worth ninety. So I had to sell. The really nice duplex worth 120 that I only owed 60 on. So over the years, I've had to liquidate some things just to stay afloat. And you live and learn. I still make mistakes today. I lost eighty thousand dollars on a uh, nine unit I bought um, last year because it it, it was kind of my fault, but it really kind of wasn't my fault. The building inspector really threw a monkey wrench in things and really caused havoc. So timing was bad. Uh, building inspector changed hands. So the, the township was one building inspector, then he went to another. And this guy took his job seriously. And I got caught in the middle. I was the collateral damage there. So you just, when you enter into a real estate deal, I guess any business venture, you have to look at the upside, the downside, and then factor all that in. And then at some point you have to make a decision. And that's how I do every one of my transactions now. I've learned to live with the, sometimes you lose money and sometimes you make money. You just have to make money more than you lose. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I think that's also why I feel this great connection is because like I, I feel like I'm following that same path as you. I hope, I mean, hopefully I'm not going to use, lose 5k a, a month, but down that path of, of maybe getting in um, and scaling a little too quickly. And, and like you mm -hmm. say, not, not, you know, preparing well for, for reserves and whatnot. And, um, you know, sometimes not, you know, running the numbers as conservatively as maybe you should. Right. Um, but, you know, you kind of touched on it a little bit. I mean, you've been in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania market, you know, your whole life. I mean, what makes Pittsburgh so attractive or what makes a lot of investors want to invest in that market? It's affordable. It's the price. You know, it's we get investors coming from all over the country. You're in Hawaii, right? For example, we have investors from China, from Japan, from Australia. I have a couple uh, client, one client from Australia. So you think, why would you buy? I would never buy something in Australia, but apparently, you know, if you live in San Francisco, New York, Boston, Honolulu, the prices are insane. You know, you, you can buy 10 properties here versus one in Honolulu. So that's what's attracting people. You can still... The average guy who's making, you know, low six figures or even less than six figures can still buy real estate. And this is one of the few, I guess, communities across the North America that are still affordable. I'm sure there's a lot of other ones, but um, that's 
become it's caused it to become a real challenge to find good deals here because you're getting folks coming here with with money without a lot of education and they're overpaying for things that you know they shouldn't be so you know the one thing i hear you know i i like to send other investors um your folks away to you know, touch base with you folks but the one thing that i noticed that maybe is the one of the biggest obstacles is the age of the properties, you know, in, in that, in your market. So like, how would you maybe like help an investor get over those fears of, of the, the ages of the properties? It's a good fear to have. It, it is. Um, it, it's just what you run into when you're buying here. If you, if you come to Pittsburgh and you say, well, I'm only going to buy something that's 20 years old or shoot, even even 40 years old, I'm going to buy only 40 years old or newer. You're looking at about 1% of all the homes or multifamilies that are here. I could tell you, I own one that was built. I own a duplex, a second, third property. I bought one of the best investments I ever made. I still own it today. I've owned it for um, 30 years now. It's a side-by-side -side duplex. It was built in the probably mid to late seventies. You know, so it's newer construction, has newer type of plumbing. It doesn't have terracotta plumbing underneath the ground. And it's been, as far as maintenance and repairs, it's it's been a blessing. And then I own these other properties that are much older. And just here as a good example, I bought a three unit in, a, in 2000, a three unit. This building's probably 100 years old plus, maybe 120. And when I bought it, I initially put uh, siding, I put windows in it. I spruced up the units, you know, carpet and paint. And I haven't touched the inside forever and I haven't touched the outside since. So this year I'm putting in probably forty-five dollars to $50,000 in one unit, fixing up the outside, putting new access doors to the basement, fixing the front porch. So those are the kind of things that catch up to you that you don't, you don't do on that spreadsheet like line item if I don't do anything for 50 years or you know or 20 years. So all that money I made over the past 22 years, it just evaporated right right before my eyes because I had to get this done. So it's it's not a bad thing. It's not like it's money going to waste. So that property is, let's say that property is worth 180000 now. After I'm done doing all this work, my rents are going to increase and- the property is going to be worth 240000 So it's not a waste of money, but you just have to be prepared for it. And if you're a new investor and you get hit with a $40,000 rehab right off the bat or three years into it, it hurts. So that's, that's the challenge with the older properties. But you can find good older properties. You just have to know what you're looking for. And you have to, you have, to be a, have a trained eye and have a good person here helping you you know, delineate these issues that maybe home inspector doesn't find, or I see that a lot home inspectors, you know, they just don't find things that, that I see that can be problems, you know? Yeah. So, you know, like I said, that, that's kind of very, you know, the Pittsburgh market, you know, you're going to find a lot of older properties, but now something that's affecting most markets is these higher interest rates. So like, how are you navigating that in your market right now? Yeah, the interest rates, they're not an issue with me. I just have to, and every investor has to adjust their offer. You know, you have to base it on higher interest rates, the higher cost of everything. Everything is just doubled in in price, you know, to rehab an apartment instead of, you know, it's just doubled. It has, I swear everything's doubled in, in cost. So you have to, as an investor, adjust how you make an offer. And the other thing to be concerned about is if you're an investor like myself and I have, you know, hundreds of units and I have you know, 20 or 30 or 40 different loans and they're all going to they see how commercial loans work. Usually if you're an LLC, you could have one unit, but it's still a commercial loan if you're an LLC. So typical banks will lock in that rate for five years. So I, I have a lot of my interest rates. If I pulled up my spreadsheet on my, my screen here, they're probably averaging um, between four and 6%. And 
And after that five year period is up, they're going to adjust. So I know some of my my interest rates are going up to instead of four and six, my average now might be five and a half and seven. So that's going to affect my cash flow. But I'm prepared for that. I'm liquid enough where it's not going to affect me. But investors running really tight and over leveraged, man, when that interest rate changes, it can be really significant, especially if it's a large portfolio. Yeah, I think, you know, that's super helpful. Like you're saying, is just running the numbers and crunching the numbers. And like you're saying, if, you know, you planned for it, right? You understood that your rates might change in five years and and you prepared for it. And that's the one thing is, you know, people can't expect rates just to go down all the time. Mm -hmm. And if that's what they're expecting, that's probably what they're going to run into trouble. Um, you know, maybe I'm reading into this a little bit too much, but I'm looking at, you know, your profile and, you know, your, your Mace property management company, you know, it says 2002. And mm -hmm. then the, the Deacon Hoover size says 2017. So was it the management side that you were more interested in starting first, like the property management? Well, here, I'll go back to, like I I was a mechanic, right? So mm -hmm. Uh, did that for about five years. My friend's buying real estate. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Let me go buy some real estate. So I don't know. I think I read a book and I bought my first place. It was a three unit. I bought an FHA and that's a whole different story because the eight is that's a whole different story. But uh, then I bought a six unit and I had the owner held financing on that. That was a great deal. It was a great deal. I just so stupid and green. Somehow I put this awesome deal together. <laughs> and then, and then I over leveraged, I, I borrowed too much money on that. I ended up having to sell that. And I was glad it was a piece of garbage anyway. So, but, um, then I thought, well, I'm going to get my real estate license. I bought three properties already in two years. So I got my real estate license. So in 1995, I got licensed and 97, I went full-time as an agent. So I was a full-time agent and an investor for a very long time. And two, and that's how I made my living. You know, I was selling real estate, helping the average home buyer buy and sell their house. And in 2002, my wife quit her job and we started the property management company. In 2018, we started my own brokerage, which was Deacon Hoover Real Estate Advisors. But I was a real estate agent since 95. So that's, mm -hmm. that's how it trended to where I am now, which we own a brokerage, we own a property management company, and we own investments. And that's that's all I do. I love it. I love getting up in the morning every day. Some days I don't, but most most days I do. What do you enjoy more? Do you enjoy more the property management side or the sales side? Um, I, I, I'm pretty much tired of sales and the property management is brutal. So I don't do any of that. <laughs> the property management side is we don't get paid enough and the people that work for me don't get paid enough because you have to put up with a lot of crap, but that comes with the territory. So you have to deal with it. Um, I enjoy, I enjoy finding deals. I'm looking at deals every day on online. My partners will send me deals. I'm assessing them. Um, you know, we have, we bought five properties this month. We bought uh, a nice flip, another potential flip, and three rental properties. And probably what we'll do is we'll probably sell all three of those. We just buy them and we we sell them at a margin. We might make $80,000 or we might make $8,000. But I have partners who that's their main income is we have to find a property with enough meat on the bone. We have to sell it to an investor to leave them enough you know, margin and we need to make a profit. And that's how they pay their bills where I have other streams of income, but I, you know, I have partners who need that money. That's why we don't, because I get the question all the time is, well, why are you selling it? Why don't you keep it? That's why, first of all, it might not be an area I like. It might not be, you know, I need to buy in a certain geographical area. I don't want like to buy out of state. I don't like to buy even out of the county. I like to be relatively close to where I am and neighborhoods I like. So everything that we get under contract is not something that fits into my buy box. So that's why I can't hold on to everything and I don't hold on to everything because I have partners who need that instant cash and they can't hold on to everything. And some don't just fit the buy box that I have in my head and the ones I want to keep in my portfolio. I love this. So let me let me go back a little bit. So you have, you know, over 30 years of experience. Is there, I would say, maybe any thing that 
catches you off guard now? I mean, are you surprised by anything that happens? I think I'd be lying if I said no, because I, I think I am surprised. But um, when I get bad news now, it's, you know, sometimes it would, I, I would, I suffered with some depression, you know, but I was very hard on myself and, you know, my whole family's relying on me and this isn't the work, you know, that, that can bear, that can, can take a lot out of you. Right. So at this point in my career, I get over things a lot quicker. You know, like I lost $80,000 on a nine unit building. I would have been decimated 10 years ago, financially and just mentally. And now, you know, a couple of days a week, I'm over it. Move on, you know, move on. Yeah, that's all, that's yeah. all you can do. Yeah. I heard you, I heard you talking about that on your, on your YouTube channel. So you're also trying to go this social media route. I love it. I see your YouTube channel, you know, Instagram, Facebook. Yeah, I'm not, I tell you, you'd probably do a better job than I do. I think you're more diligent at it. And yeah, I think you're more passionate about it. I, in my opinion, am I wrong? Do you, do you really like doing this? I like meeting the new people. I, I enjoy it. I, I, and I like, you know, talking to investors, you know, right. people like you and, you know, catching up and learning their stories. And, and I, just, yeah, I could do this all day. I mean, it yeah, is see, a lot of work, but, but it is yeah. a lot of work. I have an assistant and she does all the editing and stuff too. So I don't even know. I barely, I'm lucky I got this thing to turn on. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> well, working, but no, I don't really enjoy this part of it. I, I do it because I have to have some content. You have to be somewhat relevant and I don't care really how many people subscribe to my channel or whatever. It's not that many, but I like to have that content on there. So when I get questions, it adds validity to me and I don't have to really I don't have to talk to as many people and say, look, if you want information on this subject or this subject, just go to my YouTube channel. You're going to learn mm -hmm. a lot. And it's Pittsburgh specific. Now, if we need to talk and really dive into it, we'll, we'll talk one on one. But if I talk to everybody who wants to talk to me, I would not get any work done. And it's I don't get paid to do this. I wouldn't mind doing this every day if I got paid like Joe Rogan, but I, I don't. This doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't pay yeah. me anything. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. So I, I, I hear you. You know, I, I, part of it for me is like you're saying, it's a, I can reference people to my YouTube channel or social media. Mm -hmm. Hey, like you're saying, you know, trying to take everyone's call sometimes, you know, after a while, it's like you're saying, it just takes up your whole day. But I also like it because it also gets me to connect with people like you. And, you know, I, no, you may take it as an insult. I'm not sure. Maybe I should have checked with you first. But like I always refer to you as like Yoda. I, I tell these, you know, investors that I, I kind of look. If I had bigger ears, I'd probably kind of. And... <laughs> but I, I don't go. mind. I, I like talking to folks like you, and I I really do. You respect my time, and um, I've been able to help you, and and I'm happy to help. I just I can't talk to everyone. It's oh just, yeah, it's not possible. Yeah. Um, so actually, I've been I've been sending them your YouTube channel link first and say, hey, this is this is Yoda right here, and you know, go okay. check it out and then, you know, maybe schedule a call and see if he can help you. But um, that's how I appreciate refer to you as, but I do appreciate that. Thank you. No, but um, you know, let's, you know, let's kind of touch on it. You kind of touched on how property managers don't get paid enough, but do you have any, maybe like um, landlord horror stories? How much time you got, man? Hmm. Well, what's the most recent one then? What, what, what's the oh, most okay. recent on your mind? Here's, here's a good, here's a, here's a duplex. I learned something I'm still learning, man. Um, we bought a really nice duplex in, uh, Brookline. Brookline's part of the city. Um, uh, all brick built as a duplex up and down all separate utilities. I should have kicked out the tenant from day one, but we didn't. Okay. So we got the second floor all looking good, man. I had people just lining up to take this place. I think it was $1,100 a month in rent. I couldn't get it rented because the crazy people on the first floor, they were out of their freaking minds. So I kept <laughs> sweeping that under the rug. And finally we said, look, we got to evict them. You know, that's things sitting there, right? They were, there was hundreds of needles everywhere. They were doing drugs there. Needles everywhere. They were, they kicked in the the second floor door, they were living upstairs. Oh my God. It was, it took me four months to get rid of them and it, their place was disgusting. And that's because I, it, that's my fault. I procrastinated. I should have nipped that in the butt from day one. I said, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, I, I, I we're going to buy this place. I want them out. 
before I buy it. That would have saved me $20,000 and a lot of just aggravation. So yeah, again, I'm still learning too. Sometimes you have to know what battles to fight. And I just, man, I, I didn't see the forest through the trees and I did not see those people as being a problem. But looking back, I'm like, yeah, you know, they were a problem, Alex. You should have, you should have got rid of them from day one. So yeah, that's, that's a horse. Oh, I have another one here. There's another one. This is all my expense, by the way. So you're welcome. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I moved in. It's, it's had to do with that. Uh, we'll just go to the end part of the story. So I moved in this really nice, this nice lady, She's super nice. And she moves in her son, who's a criminal. And she's not even there. She just moved out. She's just, I'm going to, I think she just rented it so he could move in, I guess. So I wouldn't, I would never know that we ran credit and all that. She was good, clean, nice, respectful. I get a call from the police one day. She hasn't paid her rent uh, in a month or so. And my, my property manager called and then, you know, no response. And next thing you know, I get a call from the, uh, the P Pittsburgh police. Yeah. Like, Hey, um, we're, we're about to kick in your door over here at such and such a street. Uh, do you have a key? Cause we'd prefer to use the key versus kicking the door. I'm like, well, I, I think I have a key, but I'm not going to be able to get over there. So I got a friend of mine who was here and he just left. I said, can you run this over to them? So he ran over the key. Well, the guy had barricaded the door shut. So they had to kick in the door and they took him away in handcuffs. And um, yeah, I got the property back. Thankfully, now thankfully there was very little damage done. I had to replace the door. And the FBI was involved, so I called the Pittsburgh police because I know they'll they'll pay for some things. I said, hey, would you guys – I called the detective. He was very nice. I said, will you guys pay for this door? He's like, well, it's actually an FBI case. They asked us to come and assist, so you have to call the FBI. So I had my assistant called the FBI office, and they were very nice, and they paid for the door. It was like $900, so I got a new door out of it. But um, thankfully – that person who lived there did very little damage. I had to maybe put two thousand dollars into it, you know, clean it up and paint and, and a little bit here and there. So, um, yeah, that's another one. I think this is great because you know I think a lot of people that are trying to get started, you know, they think it's just gonna once you do it, you know, it gets no problems. But as you're showing that you know problems still happen, and it's just part of the territory and. It's going to, you know, be bar part of the process and you just learn from it. And you, like you say, you just keep moving on. Right. Yeah. You can't give up. You know, and I talked to somebody, I don't know if it was someone that you referred, um, but they just know if this wasn't, these folks were from Virginia. So I talked to them and he's like, yeah, I've been, you know, my wife and I, she's finally on the same page. She's, she's at the point where she's like, when are you going to buy something? Just, I'm tired of hearing about it. Just go buy something. <laughs> And he said, yeah, my, okay, so my goal is I want to own, I want to buy two a year and yada, yada, yada. And I said, here's what we need to do. You need to slow down. Let's get one, one, just, yeah. just your first one. Let's see how that works for six months. Then we'll go from there and we'll buy another one. And whatever you purchase, keep in mind, he goes, and, and I said, you know, you might lose that money. You might, it's a hundred thousand dollar house. You might lose that money. He goes, well, I'm prepared to lose a hundred thousand dollars. I said, well, you're not going to lose a hundred. You're going to, you're going to put 20% down, right? Maybe you lose 30, maybe you own it for two or three years and you lose $30,000. So be prepared for that, right? That's probably your worst case scenario. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can live with that. I said, well, good now. But if you went and did that four or five times, let's say you bought five houses in six months and three of them were mistakes. Now that 30,000 is now hundreds of thousands and you're losing sleep and it's not healthy mentally or physically. So I'd say dip your toe in the water, start slow and then progress. Cause yeah, bad things do happen sometimes and you just want to mitigate as much risk as you can. Great advice. You know, that was probably going to be my, my final, you know, question of advice you could give a new investor. So you know, do you have maybe another piece of advice, you know, besides, you know, get starting slow, dipping your feet in the water? Is there something else you could advise people? I do. I I don't know. It, it's a tough one. It's not just a clear cut piece of advice, but you, you have to be patient and you have to be impatient. 
And the reason I say that is you can't procrastinate. I would say the patience part of it is at least filling your brain with, I see books behind you there, right? Filling your brain with some books, some podcasts, listen to things like this and immersing yourself in that part of it. But that's only like the tip of the iceberg, really getting in your feet in the trenches is really where you learn, but it's good to have that that background, that foundation. If you could find someone like myself who can really help you one-on-one, my gosh, I, it would have transformed my life if I found someone like myself 30 years ago when I was a kid, you know, but that's not always accessible. Sometimes you just got to learn on your own. So be patient and in gathering information and learning. But once you've learned as much as you can possibly absorb, you have to, you have to act at some point, you're just going to have to take action. And that's where you, you can't be patient. You have to be just kind of aggressive and go for it, you know, but that there's a difference between an aggressive and being reckless and being aggressive and being educated, you know, and, um, there's, those are different, you know, being reckless, having a lot of money and being reckless can get you into a lot of trouble quickly. So just, you know, balance the two. Yeah, totally agree. So, you know, find your Yoda and, you know, also, like you said, be, you know, smart, but aggressive about it. I totally, I always tell people, it's kind of like, you know, trying to prepare for your, you know, your first child, maybe, you know, you read all the books and you try to read all these self-help books and learn about how to prepare for a child. And, but right. then once that baby comes, it's like everything's out the window, right? Everything That's a you good read, analogy. you yeah. know, it's just That's survival. Analogy, yeah. yeah, you're just trying to survive after that. And but you learn so much. And I think that's why people that do decide to have a second child, it's a lot easier process. You know, they've kind of figured out what mm-hmm. works and a lot of that fears are alleviated. But that, that's how I always try to explain it to people. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and it's not for everyone, too. Sometimes you have to mm-hmm. look in the mirror and just you know, really look at yourself and say, is this really for me? Because it's it's not always easy. I just told you two horror stories, you know, and those things can happen. If you're not ready for that, it'll, it can be a shock. So, um, I'm here to help. I, I'd love to help people. I like, I like doing what I do. So if you, you know, if you have anybody that you've been sending my way, I'm happy to spend a few minutes with them and, um, yeah, pick, pick their brain. The beauty of things today is everything's available. I mean, at your fingertips, you have you don't have to find a Yoda in person. There are so many out there. It, it it becomes probably a little bit overwhelming with all the information. Cause when I'm trying to look for something and I don't know much about it, it's like overwhelming for me, right? You ever search on the internet and you're like something, how to do something. And there's like 10 different ways to do it. And everybody's an expert. So that's probably the challenge is not finding the information. It's finding the good information and someone you connect with and then, you know, absorbing all that, digesting it and coming up with a, a task and a plan and just implementing it. Well, you know, so if people do want to reach out to you and find you, where can they connect with you? The best way is probably email. It's 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 my name. It's Alex, A-L-E-X at alexdeacon.com. And Deacon is spelled like a church deacon. That's D-E-A-C-O-N. So it's Alex at alexdeacon.com. Best way to reach me. I love it. I, I highly recommend anyone interested in investing in, in the Pittsburgh and the Pennsylvania Pittsburgh market. Yes, that you know that Pittsburgh. Reach out to Alex. But um, you know, before we go, I, I, you know, I'm no, I don't know if you're willing to, but I see one of your hobbies is singing. Are you, are you willing to sing on my channel, or is this a hundred percent? No, I'm not willing <laughs> to sing. But um. I do play the drums. I did play in a band for a short time. I really enjoyed it. I played the drums and did probably 80% of the singing. And I have an average voice and I enjoyed it. What I didn't like about being in a band was when you, I didn't go to, I didn't do many gigs, might have did 20 gigs. But when you do a gig, it's like you get there at three in the afternoon, you set up, you sound check, and you do your thing and you have fun and your friends come. And that, that's the fun part. And then, Somebody has to take all those lights down, unplug all the wires, pack it up, take it back to the the studio. You're not home till three in the morning. I did not like that part of it. So that's why I don't do it anymore. 
Oh, so I was just going to ask you if you still do it because when I do make it to Pittsburgh, I want to, you know, go to one of your gigs and see and, and see you perform. But but I will make it out there. I'm hoping to get there next year. That that's my yeah. plan. Yeah, and we then, haven't met in person, so I'd love to. I mean, you sh you've been here, right, to see your properties, or have you bought everything remotely? Oh yeah, remotely. I haven't been there yet. I haven't stepped foot in Pittsburgh. Okay, well, yeah, you need <laughs> you definitely need to get here. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, sure. yeah. So this, this, thanks for always, you know, thanks for taking my calls all the time. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Yeah, you're but, welcome. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome.